common. It was like we did it because it was a part of the service. We did it because, you know, it was there and everybody got in a line and everybody went up and they, they partook of the, the bread and the wine. You know, they were not taken in as reverentially and because we're creatures of habit, that's why. I'm not putting anybody down. I'm just saying we do things because we get used to doing them and we no longer think about it. Like sometimes, have you ever gotten home and you didn't, and you forgot you drove there? You know, because you take a certain route all the time and all of a sudden you went, oh, I'm already here. And it's not because you're not driving, you're driving, but you're, you're no longer really aware of every single moment that you're doing it because you're so used to it. And so I, I was thinking about this and I was thinking that, you know, we cannot, we cannot take it commonly. And some of you may have never really been taught the fullness of it in the first place. And then also, there is a revelation knowledge of communion that comes only by the Spirit of God revealing to you the full truth of what it really means. And so we need to be have compassion about this gift that we received from Jesus Christ, and we need to apply it to our lives. So um, we have to take this as... Um, as he really meant us to take it. So we're going to have to study it out to even know that. And so we're going to have this. So I'm going to start by breaking down the scriptures that we're all familiar with as we take communion. So these are going to be scriptures that you're probably familiar with, but that's the problem. We're familiar with them. Okay, so it's 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and 24. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that, on, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Now, the first thing that we, we need to understand is that Paul is saying, this is Paul, he's writing Corinthians, and he is saying, I received from the Lord. So the first thing we have to recognize is that was Paul one of the first, was he the disciple, one of the disciples that was there at the Last Supper? He wasn't there. Okay, so, so guess what? He had to get a re revelation from God of what that meant. So the first thing that we understand is that he had to understand something, and it was given to him by the Spirit. And he's saying, that which I received... I received this revelation, and now I'm delivering this revelation to you because he was not a participant then, but he is a participant ever since he got the revelation, which is good news for you and me because that means we may not have been there on the night when our Lord was betrayed, but we can have the revelation of what this means. Amen? Amen? Yeah. So... He took, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, Jesus gave thanks. Yes. Knowing what this was going to mean, he was grateful. Okay, we'll get more of that later. Jesus himself was grateful for what was about ready to be displayed. Yes. Okay, so think about that. He broke it. And then he looked at his disciples and he said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, we know this line, and we do that when we take communion. We, like, remember that he died on the cross. And, you know, we should be. But if we're really going to understand the significance of this, then we are going to have to toggle back and forth from the Old Testament to the New. How many of you know that the Old Testament is always foreshadowing the new? You know this, right? And God is so thorough in what he has given us that he wants us to understand this so completely that he uses a lot of symbolism in the Old Testament. The things that they did in the Old Testament were going to be done again in the New Testament, but just with a new revelation, with the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen? New and better covenant. All right. So now we're going to go 
back to understanding what is what is happening um, in the Jewish population every year every year around Easter time Jewish families get around their dining room tables and they observe the feast of Passover okay and in so doing they are fulfilling the commandment that Moses gave to them to celebrate the Passover which they also call the Seder am I saying it right Seder okay and so they were instructed by Moses to do this in remembrance of the great deliverance that God brought to them when God brought the Hebrews out of the bondage of Egypt so that they could move forward into the promised land are you following me okay now here is Jesus and they are in Jerusalem there are Jews everywhere I mean, he's not the only, he's not just there with his disciples. He is there with all the Hebrews that are gathering in Jerusalem for this great feast. And they are, they are there to celebrate what God has done, has done, to set them free from the bondage of slavery in Egypt, correct? Okay, so this would be a normal meal for them to partake of at at this time in Jerusalem at this time of year so this is not something that Jesus just came up with with his disciples at some random time are you following me okay so so they're there but this time when he takes the bread he doesn't say take this bread in remembrance of what God did in Egypt to bring you out which is what everybody else is doing he said take this bread and do it in remembrance of me everything shifts everything just changed because now the communion table the the actual Passover Seder end of the meal is going to be understood as something totally different than the tradition that they have done okay so now remember that God has sent Moses to back up a little bit and what's going on in, with the Israelites he has sent Moses into Egypt to take the people out of bondage so he, he has gone there on purpose and there's been all kinds of plagues remember let my people go no okay well here's some frogs okay let my people go no well here's a, here's a bunch of locusts so they've gone through nine plagues the final plague because they are in bondage and God is going to make sure that they are set free from the oppression of the enemy so everything that could be a plague for against the Israelites has been broken as they sat in Goshen they were under the the light of the Lord they were God's chosen people so what was happening in the rest of Egypt was not touching them but the final plague was the firstborn was going to die now God had this all planned because he's trying to give us an idea of of how necessary it is for us to understand what really is going to happen in the future and he wants us to see how that the Israelites avoid the plague of death all right so he begins to give them instructions on what needs to happen first so the first thing is is that they're told before the ceremony could begin the house has to be cleansed of all leaven okay so practicing practicing Jewish people today that are that have not accepted the Lord as their Savior yet but they will in Jesus name but anyway they they go through this and they actually have they take all the leaven out of their house still like if you have wallpaper you you have to take your wallpaper down because behind it is paste so most of them don't have wallpaper but I'm just saying I have I have 
people that I know that have had to do this because when it came time, they take it so seriously. I mean, there is not anything in their house that could rise. Okay, so leaven is a symbol of sin in the Old Testament. Whenever they talk, you know, a little leaven, you know, corrupts the whole lump. It, it's always a symbolism of sin. So God is saying the first thing you got to do is get rid of all the sin, all of the leaven, anything that could creep in to destroy what I'm about ready to do. Get it out of the house. And the, the woman had to do it because it was symbolic of, Jesus, uh, of Mary, yeah. that she was the one that was going to bring forth the ability for something sinless. Okay? So they got rid of, you know... Baking powder, breads, whatever, yeast. And, and nowadays they get rid of their cereal, their bread, their pasta. I mean, wow. I'm glad we're not under the law. Amen? Okay. So then at the Passover, they're going to have a Seder dinner. And at the Seder dinner, there are specific symbols. I won't go through all of them. I'm going to concentrate today on the, the bread and on the wine. But there, everything is symbolic. Okay. Go to a Seder dinner next year if you want to know at Easter time. Okay. Or maybe we'll have one here. So at the Seder dinner, the father places three, pizza, three pieces of matzah, which is unleavened bread, and inside of a cloth. But, but one of them... Okay. They are striped and they have marks in them, okay, because it is symbolic of the Lord being beaten with his stripes and the holes that were put in his hands and his feet. Okay, so, but of course they don't know this back then, but we're toggling between the old and the new, okay. Okay, so it is, so there's three pieces of matzo, one is broken. So the father takes the three pieces, half of, half of it, of the broken one, and two of the other full, and he puts them in a cloth, and the other half is hidden. Are you getting this? Okay, so with the New Testament understanding, that's the Old Testament, New Testament understanding is this, is that he is taking the middle piece and he's hiding it because it will be a revelation in the New Testament of those who worship Jesus. They will understand that the three pieces of bread are the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost and one of them was broken for you. Pretty cool, right? Okay. And... The broken one with the other two are reminding us of the grave clothes that Jesus, they were all wrapped in. Okay, so Jesus, Jesus died for us, but he was never alone. <laughs> all right. So then the Lord commanded every Jewish family in Egypt to select a spotless male lamb, a firstborn of the flock. Okay, so it had to be firstborn and it couldn't have anything wrong with it. And they had to bring it in their house for four days. I used to freak out over this. I'm like, how are you going to be around this cute little lamb then you're going to kill it, you know? <laughs> Until I understood why. Okay. So in Exodus 12, 3 through 6, it, it tells us this. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the 10th of the month, every man shall take for himself a, a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of persons. So he's saying, he's saying that everybody needs to have a lamb in their house, but if you're just one person, you can't eat a whole lamb. So you can, you can double up with somebody if, if you need to. So that's the point of that. Okay. Your, na your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, and you may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. So how many days do you keep 
the lamb in your household? Four. From the 10th to the 14th. Okay, four. Okay. And then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. It was a bloodbath. Can you imagine how many, I mean, there were thousands of Jewish people, thousands. So there were thousands then of these sheep that had to be slaughtered. The priests had to be there. I mean, they were up with blood everywhere, right? Okay, you have to, okay. So, and they were told you cannot break any of its bones. You can't break the bones of, of it, okay? So, and then they're told why this is all necessary. Exodus 12, 23, For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lentil, okay, so they had to take the, they had to take the blood that was spilled now, and they had it in a bucket, and they took hyssop, which I'll talk about later, of course, and they put it on the doorpost. So, they put it on the sides and they put it at the top, which actually looks like a cross. And he says, when he sees the blood on the lentil and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your house and strike you. When he sees the blood, what happens to the destroyer? canceled no effect on you right and you shall observe this thing as an ordinance for you and your sons forever how long forever. forever and it will come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you just as he promised that you will keep this service so he's saying even when you go into the promised land you're going to continue this this is supposed to continue and continue so let's go back to Jerusalem when Jesus is there. Okay, so now Jesus is going into the city of Jerusalem for a four-day period. During the time the religious leaders examined Jesus like a family did its Passover lamb. So remember he stood before all of these people and they, they were judging him and finally they said, I, I can't kill this man, he's harmless, he's done nothing wrong. He was proclaimed innocent very important because he had to be proclaimed as the innocent one okay now you know the jewish people rose up you know the story they you know there was lies about him they said crucify him crucify him the romans actually were the ones who put him on the cross but no man took his life it was not the Jewish people that took his life. It was not the Romans that took his life. Jesus laid his life down. Yes. He knew exactly as he was entering into Jerusalem exactly what all of this was. He knew the symbolism better than anyone. And he knew that he was going to be that sacrificial lamb for all of us. Okay, so um, he was taking the place of the lamb that was going to be be slain. And so, okay, so let's go back to the Passover in Egypt. The, the jugular vein was cut and the blood was poured into the basin and it was symbolic of the blood that was going to run down from the cross. Okay? For us, a graphic reminder of the blood spilled of our precious Savior so that we could be free from what from the bondage that we've been held in, okay? So the hyssop branches were used to put the blood on, and so, um, well, I'll get to that later. Okay, so as the disciples continue with the Passover meal with Jesus, he took the cup and he says, 1125, 1 Corinthians 1125, in the same manner he also took the cup after supper, saying, Pay attention, disciples. This is what this really means now. This cup is now the new covenant in my blood. So now this 
this blood, this, this what we're taking, has transferred from remembering their freedom from Pharaoh and from Egypt and from slavery. Now, this is a remembrance of my blood that was shed. And so he said, now, when you're taking this, everything is going to have all new meaning to you. Now, his disciples... Like, he's told them all along now. He keeps telling them, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to suffer. And, and you know, it's like they don't get it. They, don't, they still don't understand it. They're still fighting over who's going to be the biggest in the kingdom. Like, they're just all about them, just like most people. They're just all about that. How's this going to affect me? Well, when you come into your kingdom, what do I get? What am I going to be? Where's my title? And the Lord just keeps barreling through all of their mindsets and, and giving them truth that later will make sense to them. He's still laying out everything for them so that later when all of these things occur, they're going to have a light go on by the Holy Spirit that tells them exactly why he went to these lengths to explain everything. Okay, so he said, drink it in remembrance of me. So now... At the Passover meal, when I studied it out, it said that they, are, they take four sips on purpose. And, and this is why. Because every, every sip and every cup uh, of what they partake of has a name. So the first cup is the cup of sanctification. So when, you, when they would take the... When they would sip of the wine, they would say, We're, we are sanctified. We have been saved. We have been blessed. We are, we are sanctified from what has happened. We don't have any leaven in our house. We are in a sanctified place right here. Okay? The second cup is the cup of deliverance. And they are saying, um, this is the cup that represents we're free from slavery. The third one is the cup of redemption, and it has special significance because when Jesus took it, he said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood, and it's being poured out for you. So that is the third. And the fourth cup, he told to the, to the disciples, is the cup of restoration. And in Matthew 26, 29, it says, I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it with you anew in my father's kingdom so i'll just do a sideline of my life so years ago before i was ever a pastor just saying um i used to drink wine at night at home along with my husband all right and so and just a little bit because i was never really a fan but i did and the Lord kept saying, I don't want you to drink it anymore. And I'm like, I don't get it. It's in the Bible. Why don't you want me to drink wine? You know, I'm not overdoing it. I was never, I never participated in all of that. Well, I can't say never. When I was backslid, I did. But when I was married, I never got drunk and all of that nonsense. Okay. So I didn't understand why he was asking me this. So finally one day he said to me, are you going to obey me in this or not? And I go, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> and he goes, well, you don't have to. But it will cost you more of the anointing. And I went, all right, I'll never drink it again. I'll never touch it to my lips. That's the end of that. Done. All right. A little while later, um, my husband had given blood. And they sent him a letter in the mail saying, never give any blood again and go to the doctor immediately. There's something wrong with you. So he went, and they said, okay, you have, you have hepatitis C. Do you drink alcohol? And at the time, he's like, no, because when she quit, I quit. And they said, well, good, because that is the ingredient that exacerbates everything. So I believe God was saving my husband's life, at the same time, he was asking me for obedience. So if you think your obedience doesn't affect somebody else's life, I'm just saying 
it does. So even if it doesn't make sense to your head, it's one of those things like you can justify whatever you do. You can always make an excuse for what, you know, you can come up with a reason why everything is okay for everyone. But, uh, and this is a personal thing between you and God. I mean, if you drink wine, then answer before the Lord for that. I am not judging you. I am just saying this. If you drink too much wine, the Bible judges you. I will tell you that. If you get drunk, there are scriptures about that I can talk to you about later. But if you just sip wine, I am not going to tell you that you should never do that. However, that is between you and the Lord, and you better settle not only those things, but everything that God asks you to obey him in, because there's a reason that is so much far reaching than you could ever realize. Okay, so, so then one day, this was probably two or three years later, Someone asked me if I, you know, if I wanted any wine. I said, no, I just don't do that. And, um, you know, I, I don't do that as a, like, I'm not a holier-than-thou person. I do it because I obey God. That's it. He asked me. I said yes, period. That's what it is. Okay, so when I said no, I, I don't do that. I, I have a covenant with God about that. And, um, and the Lord said, psst, you're not the only one that is fasting wine right now. And he brought me back to that scripture. He, when I drink wine, it'll be because I'm with him and we're gonna drink it anew at the marriage supper of the lamb. Well, that is amazing. <laughs> it makes it more special to me. Okay, so. That's my deal. I don't know what your deal is, but that's my deal. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's going to be amazing. And his kingdom is going to be established in that moment. And that's exciting. Okay. So, not only is communion a ceremony, but communion is also a proclamation. So he tells us this in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup you proclaim the lord's death till he comes okay so what does proclamation mean now now we have to think about that so proclamation means when we're taking this communion we are declaring who he is his death and what it all means like Everything that, it, that we're learning today, when we take communion, we are proclaiming it, we are preaching it, we are talking about it, we are showing it, we, we, are, we are being participants, and inside of us, we are to be so aware of what this all means, that when we take it, we are making a proclamation to heaven and to earth and to every demon in hell a proclamation it's not some little uh you know cup of juice and a little wafer that you like or don't like this is something so amazing that a proclamation is being made in the spirit realm and everything has to respond to it amen okay so back to egypt it says, when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? And at the cedar, the, the children say, why is this night so different than any other night? Okay? And it says, then you will say, it is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered your households so the people bowed their heads and worshiped when they were even told what was going to happen these people you have to understand they've been in slavery for hundreds of years they they have been worn out they have been you remember their their they were given twice the work and they didn't have any strength left and so when moses is telling them what 
needs to happen and how they need to have reverence for this every year. What it says, when you remember what God did for you and how he struck the Egyptians down and he delivered your households, they are realizing that their, their firstborns were saved. They were delivered out of bondage. They, they have all of this on the inside of them. And, and so they reverently bow their heads and they worshiped. How much more should we recognize what our Lord has done and have a worshipful heart when we're taking communion? So Jesus is the Lamb of God who died as the atonement for our sins. He is our one-time atonement. One time, covered it all. One-time atonement that when we trust in him as our Lord and Savior, we accept him and we are covered by that blood. We, we are covered. He no longer even sees the sin. Our house is clean. We're purified. There's no... No ability for the enemy to come in. I mean, God, God will not only, he not only passed over the Israelites in, in uh, Goshen, but he is passing over. When he sees the blood of the lamb, we are going to get passed over on judgment day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so he's going to see the blood and he is going to say, oh, they're mine, they're mine, they're mine. There is no judgment against them anymore, for they are free. So just as the people bowed their heads and worshipped, we're going we're gonna to take a moment to worship the Lord right now. And then I'm going to share more with you. Okay, do you have it? Okay. So all that I just told you inside, and begin to think about the sacrifice of our Lord, and worship Him from the inside with a grateful heart. If faith can move a mountain, let the mountains move. We come with expectations waiting here for you waiting here for you you're the lord of all creation and still you know my heart you're the
but there's more. There's more. Psalms 105:37 says that he brought them out with silver and gold and that there was none feeble among all the tribes. Come on. So how is it that these people that were slaves that were their bodies were worn out they were mistreated all of those all of those years and yet when they came out they were healthy and wealthy come on now are you getting this okay so remember that their passover is remembrance of them being delivered but do, do you remember that he said you're going to spoil the Egyptians do you know that they got to go and take all the good stuff from the Egyptians I mean they took all the wealth of Egypt with them when they went even God healed them so much that even their shoes never wore out for 40 years I mean for real, not only is your body like okay, but your shoes are not gonna. Your shoes are gonna stay. If, even in your rebellion, because in the wilderness they had to wander around forty years because they still didn't get it. Their shoes were still good, and they were still healed. I mean, come on now. All right, if I could jump, I'd jump right now. Jump for me, yeah! Come on. Okay. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So this didn't just set them free. The whole Passover and what happened because of the blood, what happened because of their obedience, what happened because of God instituting the Passover Seder dinner was that it didn't just set them free. It made them super wealthy and super healed. How many of you ready to be super healthy and wealthy? Amen. So it was all of it is a shadow of to pointing towards Jesus' full atonement for you. His full aton atonement. We're, we're living below the bloodline because we're not, we're not understanding the whole wealth of what has happened here. This is, this is meaty, people. This is meaty. Okay, so why was God so specific about the blood? and the hyssop branches because remember I, I kind of taught you this when we were talking about David but he said in Psalms uh, 51 purge me with hyssop and I will be clean wash me and I'll be whiter than snow you remember that okay so hyssop was used med medicinally to bring healing but it was also used in the religious ceremonies to bring sanctification and purity okay so there's so much symbolism it's it's crazy. So now Jesus, I'm going to take you to the cross for a moment. And, and he's hanging on the cross. And it says in John 19, 28, Jesus, knowing that all things, all th say all things, all things. All things are now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled. He said, I thirst. He's like, this is like the icing on the cake. So he said, I thirst. So they, they poured a vessel full of sour wine, which is wine mixed with vinegar, and they filled a sponge with it, and they put it on hyssop, and they put it to his mouth. So when Jesus asked for it and said, I was thirsty, he was saying, I'm doing it all to provide all of the medicine. It is being applied all of the medicine for your healing is here. All of the sanctification in every ceremony is now complete. Oh, come on. <sighs> and after he has, he knows everything about this. You see, we, we just have finite minds and we don't even know what happened in, with the Israelites. You know, I mean, a Jewish person has a better understanding of this if they were raised to understand the Old Testament. Sometimes I wish I was a, first a priest of the Old Testament so that I could be better knowledge in the new. But anyway, I'm doing the best I can. Okay. 
It took me a lot of study to get this because I am not Jewish, but I am grafted in. <laughs> and so when Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished, done. Not only are you going to have your sins washed away, but you're going to have the completion of your sanctification and your wholeness. Glory to God. So he was drinking God's wrath for us. He was taking it for all of our sins. He was settling it forever and ever and ever. He, he was saying to everyone that it wasn't the blood of the lamb that passed over the door frame with the hyssop that stopped the angel of death. It, it's not the blood of animals that Moses taught you about that were sacrificed that's going to take care of everything for you. It is the price that I paid on the cross by the blood for all of your rebellion. And now you can enter into oneness again with the Father as if you never sinned. So his healing healed, and he healed us emotionally, he healed us physically, he healed us of spiritual burdens, he healed us from the judgment, he sacrificed everything so we would not have to face all of that. I mean, ponder that thought. First Peter 2, 24 says, Who himself bore our sins in his own body. I mean, we read this scripture, but you have to remember that Jesus actually felt your sin. I mean, he was sinless. But he had to bear the weightiness of our gunk. And so it says that he bore our sins in his own body. His own body was filled with, for the first time, something he had never experienced before, sin. He had never felt sin before. He was sinless. But he bore it on the tree that we could have righteousness and by his stripes, what are we? Healed. Healed. Healed, yes, hallelujah. So is communion important? Yes. Okay. So why is it that we're not all healed all the time? I don't know. Maybe it's because we're not understanding what he provided for us during communion. But today could be your day. Look at somebody and say, today could be your day. It takes the revelation of the Spirit, but... But we have to consider what it all means. And so, yes, it is important. And as we partake of it and we understand that we are taking it as a, an action of acknowledging all of these things, that we can, we can be healed. Okay, so ushers, you can hand it out. But don't, don't take anything when they give it to you because I'm still instructing you. Okay, so they're going to hand out the communion. So now here comes the uncomfortable parts that nobody usually talks about when communion is given. Okay, most, most people just read that first part and they go, okay, this is the blood, this is the body, this is blah, blah, blah. And then everybody takes and drinks of the, of the wine and the, and the bread. Okay, and then we're done with communion and everybody moves on with their day. But that is not where it stops in the Bible. You know, the Bible says that Jesus had some hard sayings. You ready? You ready? Okay. Now, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven. Whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Most people don't preach on that because what in the world is he talking about? 
<laughs> you know, we pass over it because we don't have understanding. We really don't want to understand this. We just want to just take communion and be happy. You know, we know he died on the cross for us. Yay. But it's still there. Are we going to take the whole Bible or are we going to just, just take the parts we like? All right. So now we have to discuss what that means. So he says, if you eat this bread or drink this cup unworthily, you're guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So this is our remedy. This is our remedy. Good news. Okay. Somber moment. Good news follows. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat the bread and drink of the cup. So what he's trying to say is this, is that this is a moment that you have to be somber before the Lord. This is a moment that before you just send everybody up to take communion, he is warning us that we have to examine our... This is not for me to tell you you've sinned. It's nobody's business what you've done, but you and God. However, this scripture is in there because this is the time that you go before the Lord and you let you and him examine your own heart to see if you are properly discerning the bread and what it means and properly discerning the cup and what it means. Okay, this doesn't necessarily, I mean, it could mean, because in, a, in another portion of the Bible, when it's talking about this, it says that if you have ought against your brother, you need to not take it and go be reconciled with your brother before you drink it. I mean, God must think this is pretty important. Unforgiveness is one of those things you need to examine in your heart. Thank you. So if you have unforgiveness towards somebody, you need to reconcile that. It, I mean, it could be, it could be that little and that big. If you have judgment against God, you need to reconcile that. Now is the time for you to let God examine your heart between you and the Lord. Like, what is going on? I am not going to take the communion without thinking about God allowing me to look into my own heart and say, wow, is there something in there that doesn't belong? Maybe it's just that you don't love like you should. If you say that you love him and you don't love your brother, First John tells us, we're liars. I mean, hard sayings, hard sayings, yet the full Bible. Okay. Good news. We can take a moment. We can let the Holy Spirit show us if there's something that is between us and the Lord. And he says that the moment you confess your sin before him, that he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Do you remember that? So this is not something you don't need to be condemned. You don't need to beat yourself up. This is not a condemnation moment. This is an examining moment. This is a freedom moment. This is a I'm all in moment. Do you understand? Okay, so I'm going to give you a moment to be between you and the Lord right now. It's just you and him. No one else knows the secrets of our hearts like we do. There are, there are things that people, we can put on a happy face. We can, we can act like every other person in the building. But this is the moment where we, before God, are about ready to partake of what his son's price was. For us to be cleansed, so let's be cleansed. So if there's anything, if you lied, if you cheated, if you, if you looked at something you shouldn't have, if you said things you shouldn't say, I mean, I could read a list, but I won't because you know what you're guilty of. You know. So let him have all of you in your heart.
The cry of your heart has to be whatever you ask me, Lord. Whatever you take away, it's for my good. Whatever you want me to do, I'm willing. Whatever you ask me to give up or to do, I'm going to listen to your voice. And I'm asking you, Lord, to forgive me of right now. Cleanse me, Lord. Cleanse me, Lord. Let me be righteous in your eyes, Lord Jesus. I don't want anything between me and you. Nothing, Lord, nothing. Nothing, Lord Jesus, goes on to say that if we would judge ourselves, we wouldn't have to be judged. If we took this as serious as we need to before him, there would be no need for any judgment. Because if we cleaned out our hearts like this all the time, I mean, if we know this is part of communion, we should take communion every day. And we should clean our hearts out every day. We should examine ourselves every day and say, don't let me carry something from today into tomorrow that is between me and you. Let me take care of this right now. Can you imagine if every Christian got a revelation of this and took the time to let God examine them before him every day, how things would change? Because we got buildup. We get residue, and then we get residue on the residue. But if we go before the Lord and we say, wow, today I'm letting you examine my heart again. Imagine the freedom we would walk in. Imagine the revelation we would have, because there's going to be no blockage. When, when Jesus was teaching his disciples in John, he said, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my Father has given you the bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. He's saying, this is so big, you got to get it. This is like, I came so you could have life. I am the bread. And they said, oh, give us that bread. And Jesus said, I am the bread. This is so far above their brains. They're like, you know, this isn't something that they have no concept of up to this point. They're Jewish. They've been... They've been taught the law. They don't know about Jesus. They, they're still trying to grasp the reality of everything that he is saying, okay? But it's only the, the bread of, of life from Jesus that is going to change everything. And so he said this then. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. How long are they going to live? And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. His body. Now, that is a weird saying. I mean, you know, this is how Jesus gets rid of a bunch of people later. But he says, this is my actual flesh that I'm giving to the life of the world. But see, you understand that they know the Old Testament. Okay, so... If you read Isaiah, 
53.5, it says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we're healed. He's saying, this is all my body. This is what, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about everything that I did, and this is all about my body. My, the bread is me. I am the bread. The bread is me. Okay. So the Passover was a night of obedience. And so what, what they did was they did it by faith. They had to obey what Moses told them to do by faith. And just like that, in the, in the obedience to God, in recognizing what we're actually doing here, we are understanding that the blood of Jesus Christ is making the difference of us either remaining slaves or being free. It is making the difference of us being poor or us being prosperous. It is making the difference of us staying under the oppression of the enemy or us plundering the enemy and taking back everything he's stolen from us. Just as the natural, the natural mind cannot understand this, by the Spirit of God... These, these words, Jesus said these words are, are spirit and they are life. You have to take it by the spirit. Your brain cannot take all of this in, but you can understand it on the inside. Okay. So, the blood of, the, of their lambs had no real power in it other than their obedience. But the blood of our lamb has all power. Amen. Amen? All power. It has the power to destroy bondage. It has the power to destroy sickness, disease, and release to us our sonship. Wow. We all of a sudden understand that we have nothing missing, nothing broken because of this. So when we're taking communion we have to understand we're applying the blood and as we partake of the blood, bread we are partaking of the body of Christ okay so okay wow now when he says that if we don't examine ourselves, and if we take it in an unworthy manner, it doesn't mean, I don't, I don't want you to get the wrong connotation of this. So it doesn't take away grace. We're, don't, none of us are worthy, you do realize, right? We're, we're not worthy, but because of the price he paid, we are worthy. So there is a provision of grace because of Christ's death, but if we don't discern it properly, if we're, if we're not understanding the fullness of what he provided, we won't have the fullness of our healing and we won't take the fullness of our sanctification and our purification. We'll miss out on what he provided for us, which is a shame because he did it anyway. But just like he died for everybody to be saved, is everybody saved? No. You know why? They either don't know about it or they haven't chosen him. That, it's simple. It's the Bible. It's, this, is, this is Bible 101 stuff. You, he did it all. He did it all. He provided everything. But it's still up to us. It's still up to us to receive it or reject it. That's where, where it is. Okay, so, so his grace is still sufficient for you, but you have to receive it by grace. You have to actually examine yourself and take the Lord's Supper with the full knowledge of it. Okay, so when we take communion, it is Jesus' ultimate declaration, and he's denying himself to the disciples. So he said, I'm giving my very life. This bread is me. I'm giving it all, and I'm giving my very blood. It is me. So if you look at the wafer, don't look at it like it's not his body, and don't look at grape juice like it's nothing. You, ha you have to realize it's him laying down his life. Okay, so in John 6, 54, 
He said, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Hallelujah. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Okay, people are freaking out at this point when he's talking to them. And he says, as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. It's a continual feeding. It's not a one-time communion, understanding that you're communing with God and receiving what Jesus did. It is a continual thing that is supposed to happen. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and they are dead. If you eat this bread, you're going to live forever. And he said these things in the, in the synagogue in Capernaum. And a whole bunch of people left. <laughs> and they said, this is a hard saying. Who can, who can understand this? You're telling me I have to eat your flesh and drink your blood. I'm out of here. I mean, that's cannibalism. I'm, you know, they were freaking out, right? So Jesus looks around. He sees everybody's gone except for his disciples. And he, he knew in himself that even his disciples were complaining about this. Can you imagine? Okay, I, I don't think we do. But anyway, he looks at them and he goes, like he knows everything in our heart, right? And he goes, does this offend you too? Are you freaking out too? I mean, do you still not get it? And he says, what then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit. He's saying, get out of your heads. I'm not asking you to eat my body right now. Like, don't take a chunk. <laughs> He's like, get, get out of your brain. You got to get into the spirit of what I'm trying to say. He's like, it's the it, it's Spirit who gives life. The flesh, what you can understand in the natural is going to give you nothing. Quit trying to figure everything out in your heads, people. Just quit it. It is going to work, right? It is the spirit who gives life. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. He's saying the spirit of God is going to, it's, it's imparting to you. If you'll have ears to hear and if you'll suck it into yourself, you will understand what I'm saying. I'm not asking you for the natural. I am asking you for the spiritual understanding that when you are partakers of this, you are actually consuming all of me in all of you for you to have the full benefit package. Now they want to eat. Well, I do, right? And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one could come to me unless it's granted by my father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked away from them. And Jesus said to the 12, are you going to go away too? And Simon Peter, yay for Simon Peter, said, Lord, who are we going to go to? <laughs> you have the words of eternal life. He's like, I may not understand this because this is really whacked out in the natural. But I have no one else to go to that speaks these kind of words. And all I know is when you're talking to me, something's happening on the inside. All I know is there's a deposit being made on the inside. And if I don't understand it now, I'm going to understand it later. And so he's like, I'm not going anywhere. I, I'm going to sit here even if this makes no sense to me because I know someday it will because I've already been this route. I've already learned what I didn't know. And then I found out what I didn't know and it became known to me. So he's like, I, I, as for me, I'm sitting here. I am not moving away because your words are doing something on the inside of me. They're awakening something inside of me that needs to be awakened. There is something I'm going to know about later that I'm going to walk out. And indeed, he did. So, it's a divine intervention of God when we actually take the body and the blood. Jesus' atonement on the cross brought back oneness between creation and the creator. It's so beautiful. So now we actually are going to take the bread. So take the bread. 
You see it has, has those little marks? Isn't that wonderful? And I'm going to reread to you this. As I receive from the Lord, as we receive the revelation of the Lord today, we are, we are being delivered, we are understanding from our old ways of thinking that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, take eat. This is really my body that was broken for you. Forget about Egypt and understand it's remembering me and the sacrifice of my stripes, the sacrifice of my death. Do it in remembrance of me. Okay. Now, if you take that as a, from the revelation that we've learned, your healing is taking place with his broken body. By his stripes, you are healed. Are, are, are healed. That's what it says. If you will receive this by the Spirit, your body will line up. It could be a miracle or it could be healing. Who cares? You get it. So with the revelation of his broken body for us, of his sacrifice on the cross, we are remembering it. So Lord, right now, Lord, we have just ingested the truth. of what you did for us that we could never do for ourselves. Lord, just as you made provision for the Israelites to come out healed, Lord, we are asking that we have a revelation that that worked for us on your cross. Who we come out healed, we come out healed, Lord. That wholeness is a provision because of your body. It is. It is. It is. It is. So Lord, just as they had to eat the whole lamb, they had to eat it all. They couldn't leave any of it. We are taking all of you. We are receiving all of you. We're not going to just take the salvation part. We like that part. We know we're going to we're going to have you forever in eternity because we love you. Because we've accepted you as Lord and Savior. Oh, just in case nobody has done that. <laughs> if you've never accepted the Lord as your Savior, if you just acknowledged him as the Son of God, that's great. But if you haven't taken him personally as your Savior and your Lord, you have that opportunity right now. So if that's you, you just need to repeat this and mean it with all of your heart father we come to you today we ask that you forgive us of all of our sin and we take the provision of your blood Jesus that covers that sin I ask you to forgive me of everything I've ever done and cover it with your blood and let me be yours to live righteously before you. In Jesus' name, amen. So Lord, we thank you for that and we thank you that we are receiving our healing now. We expect everything to shift because we have ingested the fullness of your price. 
And Lord, we thank you. We thank you for blind eyes seeing. We thank you for lame people walking and running and praising the Lord. We thank you for cancer dying. We thank you, Lord, for indigestion to go away. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that any kind of virus has to die in, in the name of the Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we are done with slavery. Lord, we thank you that we are coming out of Egypt. We are not under the oppression of the enemy anymore but we are free because of you and Lord we declare that thank you thank you for your provision Lord <laughs> that means okay it's important <laughs> warning warning <laughs> okay all right now we go to the to the cup the blood of Christ that brings us into union with the Godhead we are announcing it even to ourselves that we are partaking in a new and better covenant because he said in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five, this cup is now the testament in my blood it is the new covenant we're no longer operating under the law we are operating under grace we are no longer slaves, but we are sons and daughters. Hallelujah. So take the cup in your hand. And now, as you're partaking of this, I want you to see the doorposts in Egypt that were covered by the blood. And then I want you to understand that it was the blood that stopped the death angel. It was, it was the blood that caused the Passover. Then I want you to flip to the New Testament and picture the cross. Now understand his blood that is represented in this cup is the cup of the new and better covenant. This is the cup of sanctification. This is the cup of deliverance. This is the cup of redemption. You are free. You are one with him. So drink it in remembrance of him. Remember that Jesus is waiting for us until he drinks the wine with us again in heaven and his Father's kingdom is established. That is the word of the Lord about communion. And it says in Psalms 119.89, Forever, O Lord, forever is your word settled in heaven. Jesus is the word and it's settled. Amen? Amen. Now we're going to put the, oh, you did it. All right. So I want you to, you know, it says that when they told them what it meant and how they were going to celebrate, it said that they couldn't help themselves but to worship God. So we worshiped God with singing, but there's more to worship, as we know, in this church. You worship God by your giving. You worship God by saying, everything that I have and the provision that you've given me, I really owe it all back to you. But he, he asks for a tenth. He says, bring your full tithe into the storehouse so, so there will be abundance in the house and overflowing. So we're going to come this morning. Leslie's going to sing. We're going to praise the Lord. And please bring your offering to the front and and do it with reverence as unto him this is to me i was shaking when i was writing this i was crying when i was studying all of this this is so sobering to me as far as we need to be so sincere before the lord we have just partaken of all of the provisions that he made for us because of his death and resurrection all right okay so and i will join you Slave to 
If you would like to support this ministry with a financial contribution, visit our website at www.LibertyLifeCenter.org. Find the link to the left that says Donate Now and follow the instructions there. Thank you for being a part of what God is doing worldwide through this ministry. Thank you.